Vamos a comenzar con las conferencias del día. Me piden que me sitúe aquí para salir bien una foto. <risa> eh, nuestro primer ponente es Dan Riegelstein. Él es arquitecto, especialista en diseño urbano y planeamiento y también en arquitectura, lógicamente. Es el director de Arup. Arup es una de las empresas de arquitectura e ingeniería más importantes del mundo. Eh, por ejemplo, les diré como curiosidades, una que eh, fue el fundador de ANU, quien eh, en los años 60 trabajó con el arquitecto John Hudson en el proyecto de la ópera de Sydney. Y fue a partir de ese proyecto emblemático como después ANU fue creciendo y llegar a ser lo que es hoy en día. Bueno, pues en esa empresa, eh, Dan Hillstein es director del departamento de Cities Planning and Design, Master Planning and Urban Design. Es licenciado en Ciencias en Estudios Arquitectónicos por la Universidad de Illinois. Estudió en el Massachusetts Institute of Technology y obtuvo el Máster de Arquitectura allí en el año 91. Hizo dos cursos en la Harvard Graduate School of Design. Hizo dos años de estudios de arquitectura en l'Ecole d'Architecture de Bayseuil, en Francia, y ejerce como arquitecto colegiado en los Estados Unidos desde 1996. En general, Dan le interesa mucho las características físicas de un lugar y cómo la planificación, el diseño urbano, las infraestructuras y la arquitectura pueden crear un entorno público positivo. Esto es evidente en el importante papel que ha desempeñado en la realización de proyectos complejos a través del diseño colaborativo y su dedicación a lo largo de más de 30 años de experiencia profesional en todo el mundo. Como académico docente, es profesor tutor de la Barrel School de la Universidad College de, London, de Londres, es crítico de proyectos en la Architectural Association of London, fue profesor invitado en el, en el Instituto Tecnológico de Massachusetts, así como en la Universidad de, de Illinois, en el Politécnico de Milano y en la Universidad de Tesalo el Bolos en Grecia. Y es además profesor adjunto en el MIT, en el Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Eh, ha trabajado en todos los campos profesionales ha ido y por haber. Por ejemplo, en, en, en congresos y reuniones de diseño urbano. Por ejemplo, dando conferencias y, y, y charlas en todo el mundo. Eh, obteniendo numerosos premios nacionales en Estados Unidos e internacionales. Con experiencia proyectual en comunidades sostenibles, en master plan en educación institucional, en, en proyectos de carácter público, en proyectos de distritos de ciudades específicos, o en proyectos de un planeamiento urbano y territorial. Son innumerables, pero los dos, eh, de los dos más recientes, para, también para que se haga un poco idea de la escala de las cosas que trabaja Arú, uno es en la ciudad de Neón, en Arabia Saudí, que es un, donde han hecho un master plan eh, urbano, industrial, de distrito y aeroportuario para una nueva iniciativa dirigida por el gobierno saudí para crear un modelo de ciudad-región en el, para el siglo XXI, que acomode a una población aproximada de 5 millones de personas en un sitio de 26.000 kilómetros cuadrados. O otro es el proyecto de la nueva capital del Cairo, el nuevo Cairo, en Egipto, para una nueva iniciativa dirigida por el gobierno egipcio para crear una nueva ciudad capital para Egipto que acomode a una población de aproximadamente 5 millones de personas en un sitio de 700 kilómetros cuadrados. Sin más, les dejo con Dan Riquestein. Muchas gracias, Vicente. Buenos días a todos. I'm sorry, the rest is going to have to be in English because my Spanish is at zero. <laughs> But, um, and I hope that I've understood a third of what was said before, and I will provide some continuity and uh, sort of maybe a launch pad for the rest of your dialogues going forward today and tomorrow. So I love this idea of how 
this island could be this amazing laboratory for climate change. And I thought that that, that um, remit is an amazing uh, point of dialogue for everybody here today and tomorrow. So I'm going to go through a quick introduction of, again, a little bit more of who I am and my very uh, new understanding of Lanzarote. Um, and I'll go through a series of themes that I thought uh, would be interesting to discuss through a series of case studies. And I'll walk to the next So again, just um, just put more personal touch on what Tangente uh, just went through. Um, I'm born and raised in Chicago. And one of my uh, most proud professional moments was to be able to be, be uh, a primary instigator of this master plan for Millennium Park in Chicago with the mayor, and to see how it's really um, flourished over the years to, to bring people together of all walks of life from uh, the city, from the suburbs, from the inner neighborhoods, and now even internationally. It's been amazing to watch. Um, so that's given me great pleasure. Um, I am uh, very passionate about cities. You know, I'm an architect. I love solving the most complex challenges that cities face. I propose environmental-led design thinking that pr promotes planetary health. Uh, and I have a passion for more human-centric ways of creating places. And of course, I love to connect the dots, to collaborate with people, to deliver these, these, these things. So I have a broad range of experience across lots of different scales uh, in different geographies, UK, Europe, Middle East, Africa, Asia, and of course North America. Um, and I really, as I said, um, am interested in how the landscape, the built form, the built environment can actually create places for people, to bring, bring, bring us all together, to provide memorable environments for us all, while still being sort of a champion of the planet. So this is my first time to the Canary Islands, so I have a lot to learn. Um, as I arrived here, I just went up on top of the hotel here today, yesterday, and looked out. It's just an amazing setting. I always wanted to come, so I'm so pleased to be invited to be here with you all today. It is very, uh, it looks like to be unique. I'm gonna, I look forward to traveling around the island uh, later today, tomorrow on Saturday. Um, it reminds me of many unique places around the world um, in terms of its, its topography, its unique, diverse landscape. The way in which uh, I've never seen a volcano, so that's going to be cool. <laughs> uh, and just how these these geological formations, and Jim was describing how even these lines of volcanoes have created different identities within the island itself, the south side of the island versus the north side. So I'm really interested to see that phenomenon on the first hand. I think it's quite obvious why it's a why it's a vacation spot, why it's quite intriguing for people around the world to come. It seems like there's an amazing variety of things people can do and see here that they that they may, may find a very unique experience that they can't find elsewhere. So some key themes. I thought it would be good to, uh, based on this, this idea that the, that the island can be a, a laboratory for the rest of the world to learn from, a little microcosm of the world itself, I picked four topics, and I'll walk through those uh, one by one, um, and four, four or five projects that fall underneath those themes to show you how those ideas have played out elsewhere. And I think if there's one, key message to take away from my talk today is you're not alone in this. We all have this fight together. Um, and there's lots of people who are asking the same questions you were all asking. And it'd be wonderful if I could even help you to connect those dots so you can talk to one another. Uh, because we're all talking about the same issues, which is amazing, because 20 years ago, I think there was just a handful of us talking about this. So as I walk through these projects, I'll try to give you a sense of scale of these places and how they relate back to Lanzarote. So the first thing, I think this idea of this dynamic island destination, of course it's heavily focused on tourism today, what could its future be tomorrow? And you're asking the right questions. What is the, the, the biggest footprint tourism can play in the economy here? And is, is it a dangerous thing to have that much of your economic output in that in one bucket? Um, so I think that it's quite clear why that's the case here. It's an amazing connection to nature, to the skies at night, um, to this incredible uh, place on the sea, and also interesting things even in the land that you can come see as well, uh, with the whole arts community that's, uh, that's been promoted over the years. Um, so, but I'm sure COVID also taught you some lessons that that was not maybe the most sustainable economy to, to go forward with. So lots of other places are thinking the same thing, particularly places that are tourism based like yours, or in the case of the Middle East, the economies that are based on, on fossil fuels, which have to really think about different things. So I just, from my own understanding, uh, this has helped me to, to get a sense of how much of your economy and labor force is focused in the service industries, which I'm assuming is mostly 
tourism. But at the same time, I love this diagram on the right that I found that's uh, really about the interplay between all the different ecosystems on the island, in the cities, in the villages, that uh, any, tour, any economic strategy put in place for the future has to understand all the knock-on effects that it may have. So this first project is, is um, the Kingdom of Bahrain, which is um, which was led by the Crown Prince, a new Crown Prince that uh, came to power in 2005-2007. And we worked for two years with him to create a new plan and vision for the entire kingdom. So Bahrain is uh, very similar in size uh, as Lanzarote. It's about 760 square kilometers, just smaller, but it's much larger in population, over 1.7 million people, to give you a sense. This is just off the coast of Saudi Arabia in the Arab Gulf. So I think the, the clear underpinning here was the Crown Prince, Prince saw this need to diversify away from oil and gas. It, Bahrain used to be the leading financial center of the Middle East, which started losing its weight when Dubai sort of, sort of hit all of its uh, cylinders. So he set up an economic development board that really sought to expand and sell the, his country to the world. I think that's super important. So I think understanding how that group took the vision um, forward to, to show that it's a place that is worth investing in, it's a safe place to do business, it's easy to do business there, and they were really open to new ideas. So I think that would be a, a first point of contact I would suggest you make, maybe reach out to, is to understand how did they set this up back 20 years ago, 15 years ago, and how are they doing that today? Because this, the country is actually growing quicker than, than they, they had, we had imagined at the time. So here again, it was all about working with our economic consultants to understand what does the country <coughs> offer to expand their economy beyond oil and gas. So it was really to re-kickstart re the financial um, industry to create another, maybe more sustainable and uh, more on the ground um, environment for business and finance, to bring that back, um, to promote tourism. But they can't compete with other tourism areas in the Middle East. So they sought, we found through the process, to focus on families. So it's a much more simple kind of tours to offer. It's not trying to be all bells and whistles to everybody, but really focus on uh, people in the Middle East with young families. Not even trying to get international tourism, but just regional tourism. So that's something to think about as well. They have, obviously, through their ports, uh, lots of industries. So how could they leverage those industries in that port to take on more, more uh, trade internationally through the maritime port, through the airport, and maybe change that technology to be less petrochemical base to be a much more high-tech industry. And of course, oil and gas remain as a reserve to sort of help them transition across to these new, new, new markets. And of course, you know, like all economic plans, you, you project out the future, and we, we, present, we projected sort of low, medium, and high growth, and what actually happened is even more. It's quite surprising. So as urban planners, what did we do? We, we took the numbers from the economists and we transitioned those into land needs. So whatever the increase was in jobs, we converted that into uh, floor area of industrial space, of office space, of hotel rooms, and converted it into land. So we knew how much land we would need going forward. So we had our, our brief, our design brief. Next, we looked at the place. It's one of the most amazing uh, maritime environments with coral reefs that are under attack because they're very easy, they're very shallow land, they're very easy to reclaim land, probably unlike here. So we looked at that, and for the first time, I think in the world, uh, maybe some of the Seychelles, did a master plan for the water, where to build, where not to build. And we understood there's also opportunities to infill within the existing cities and villages and towns. They didn't have a land use plan for their entire, their entire country. This was all sort of unplanned, and only, only in the neighborhoods that had grown in the 1970s and 80s but they were done individually as projects. So we actually land use plan the entire country. The Crown Prince said, I want every inch to have a designation and a rule and regulation to follow. And that was based on their economic projections. We zoomed in to certain areas. In this case, this is, this is the capital, Manama, where there's, as you can see in those images, there's it's a density. There's lots of opportunities to infill, to really intensify that environment and, and sort of get away from the car-based uh, environments. So we imagined what the Corniche could look like, how it could be densify to create this intensive urban environment along the, 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 the seafront, uh, which would promote businesses and people to come in a new way. The coastline as well was, was forgotten, um, and only 3% of the coast was accessible to the public. It had been, privately, um, it had been heavily privatized. 
So we looked at that as an opportunity and established a series of typologies that could uh, benefit, you know, natural areas, could uh, be designed for tourism, and also uh, bring in new environments like mangrove edges, and obviously urban promenades uh, near the city center, and sort of give them an image of what their future could look like. I think that's also important. It may not have looked like this 20 years from now, but just to give people a sense of pride and opportunity to sell this as, as their vision for the future physically, not just in words, but in, but in an image that tells all the stories. We're going to densify our city, pedestrianize it, transit, and then really maintain the waterfront as a public amenity. Another project on a much smaller scale, a different kind of project, is uh, in Naoshima Island in, in Japan, where we were involved um, in the very early days in a sort of a, a two-month charrette to understand how could we take this island um, towards, towards a new kind of future. Now, uh, Naoshima Island, in this case, is actually much smaller. That's the same scale. <laughs> but I think there's still some lessons learned, lessons to be learned from this example. So it's an island, I think, quite similar to Lanzarote in terms of its interesting topography. Obviously, it's not, it's not volcanic, I don't believe, in this case, but a series of villages that are dotted around the edges. And those are primarily fishing villages. But on the north, there was um, an emerging industrial zone, which was also degrading the natural environment. But its setting was quite idyllic. idyllic. You probably have heard of this island. This is the place where this incredible arts community has arrived. Um, uh, Yayo's uh, pumpkin fell into the sea recently. They just brought it back. Um, but this provides sort of an impetus for people to, to, to go there. So the vision was really to uh, allow for growth, but to keep it contained and reinforce the existing village environments, not to let it spread across uncontrolled. Um, and I, I have to, having to look out over Lanzarote, it feels like that's also um, pretty well controlled, it seems, here, too. But I, I see the risk that as, as you begin to grow, you begin to um, lose that, the character of the openness between these villages that makes it feel very different and special from anywhere else. The last thing you want is the Cote d'Azur arriving here. So we were shredding and just thinking of different ways to which to bring that sort of plan alive and what are the different people we could attract um, in, in terms of, um, of tourism, but also in terms of craftsmen, in terms of artists that could, could actually be uh, incubated and could actually become a place of, of promoting uh, culture and art. At the same time, also looking at the amazing landscape to understand which things should be protected, which areas, again, in the north in particular, that could be enhanced and brought back to a natural life as after that was damaged by industry. And then look at different themes for different villages that the, the existing and old fishing village, villages can become gateways into the island to sort of tell people there's a historic um, meaning to these places, to create a brand new series of villages that could be focused on culture, uh, artist communities um, uh, that could collate and bring to coalesce uh, people that are interested in the design industry. I think that's a great opportunity here, as an example. And then next to the industry that's happening, just intensify that, make it clean, make it intense, but that could be maybe the most intensive place, focused in one area only of the island. Yeah, and I think it's, it's uh, again, I've never been, so I need to go. <laughs> I'm going to go to see my friend in Tokyo next year. Um, but it just seems like an incredible opportunity which has many parallels to uh, the arts, arts program you have here that can be harnessed into not just these touristic moments, but also creating an uh, ecosystem around that. Second theme I call the autonomous island. So I think you have an amazing opportunity here um, to move away from the dependence of the rest of the world. So how can you create your own food, you create your own energy, and I know it's tough, but also have your own water. Um, and turn that into an opportunity to showcase to the world how that can be done. So I've learned through um, some, of my, some of my colleagues back home in London who actually did their thesis in Lanzarote that I'm happy to share, um, understood sort of the historic past of agriculture, the strength that it used to have, that's now been lost over time primarily to tourism. But there is this wonderful, unique uh, industry that seems, and we had those delicious potatoes last night, Jen, thank you. Um, yeah, the wine industry, the uh, different kinds of agriculture that can be provided here. And if we can, if we can do it here in Lanzarote, you can probably do it in other places around the world where it's quite arid. So this, this summary is for people to me to understand how much of this land has actually been lost 
um, how much the land is actually lost uh, for tax, uh, to other things or just abandoned. So it seems like the land is there. Obviously, water is scarce, and that's probably what's causing that, as well as the pressure for tourism. But that could be an amazing opportunity to bring that back. So how could how could that look? look? This is a project in China off the coast of Shanghai. So Shanghai is here, called Chengming Island, about a thousand square kilometers in size. Again, much more higher population than Nanjing, about 700,000 people. Uh, this is meant to be um, a relief valve and future growth zone for Shanghai. The problem is today it's most of the food and agriculture that's supplying the city. So what's the plan to grow sustainably while maintaining that important ecological resource and food resource? So that's sort of how the city is developing. Um, this, is, this plan was done back in 2010. Um, but so that you can see how that could be a potential place for further growth to the north. So this, the system today and at the time was a series of agricultural fields with these seawater canals that were brought in to provide water uh, to the fields mostly. I think of uh, rice and fish farming. Um, so that is an ecosystem that we said we need to enhance and protect as we begin to think about urbanization of the island. So here the idea was to naturalize that, actually capture fresh rainwater instead of bringing in the seawater, create a series of lakes in the middle of the island, which is the low point, actually. And if we could capture, cleanse, clean, and then restore the water, those would be maybe the, the, the best way to, in this case, where there is a lot of rain, uh, here to, to create freshwater resource there. And then the city developments that happen along the coast uh, could help, um, again, capture that water and, sh and sh uh, channel it to the north, to this agricultural land, and then maintain all these fishing, uh, sorry, all these farming environments um, in the middle of the island. So the strategy was really about promoting organic farming um, to create more healthy foods, um, more sustainable farming practices to protect the wilderness, which is amazing. Use those greenways and those water channels and the lakes as a wildlife haven that could also attract people. Uh, so working with those green systems that are in place to enhance those. Uh, but that could also even become a place for ecotourism, a relief. If someone wanted to take a, a day out from Shanghai, they could go to the island, get their kids to a wilderness park um, and, and go fishing or kayaking. And then have clear, concentrated, bespoke places for urban development with new cities. And, and they can be quite dense, so that they're walkable, they're compact, uh, and uh, their footprint is, is restrained um, so that the rest of the island can remain in its natural state, enhanced natural state. Um, so not much of the urban development has happened, but a lot of eco um, enhancements have happened, and it's really become um, this amazing sort of um, interpretive center um, arrived on the, on the site recently. And it is really now setting the stage for what's to come. And it's also important as you think about the future, have a pilot project that sort of sells the vision. People can come and touch and see what's about to come. So understand where you're headed. The next theme is really, um, you know, many years ago we were talking about net zero. Net zero should be dead. We need to talk about net positive now. We have to produce more than we need. We have to absorb more than, than we've given off in the past. And so this is really about planetary health. I'm not going to talk too much about sea level rise, because I don't know the exact issues you're dealing with. It seems to me it's probably limited here, although there are probably areas that are uh, susceptible to sea level rise. I'm going to focus more on planetary health. And that's really, for your, for your environment, they're talking about energy, water, and waste. And how can the island self-sustain itself over time? And it's good to see some of the new programs of, of wind and solar that I've, I've read about. Um, to see that sort of pushing, but to me there's a, kind of the elephant in the room, <laughs> which is 85% uh, of the electricity is uh, still powered by fossil fuels. In fact, the statistic is still correct, which is, you know, I'm sorry, just not good enough. It's not good enough, and I'm sorry for being harsh, but it just isn't. We all need to move the needle, and, and there are other places that, uh, that are seeing this as well. Um, and of course, you know, the war with Ukraine has just emphasized that even, even more. But there are some good points. You've got a, it seems like you have a, a wave energy project that's underway, which will give you three megawatts. But this is an amazing stat. You, you can, just your geothermal resources, to generate 450 megawatts is plenty enough for the island itself. So could Lanzarote, could the Canary Islands take inspiration from Iceland, um, where they produce 
99.99% of their energy, three quarters of it through geothermal, and about a quarter of it through wave, wave and um, hydropower. Um, so they're leading the world on this, and I think not many places can do this because they don't have that. So it's a question. I don't know all the details about geothermal here, but there are some amazing changes. I think it's becoming much more efficient. So that's a question I put out there. Is that part of the answer? There's no silver bullet. You have to have multiple strands, I think. Uh, but this could be one of the answers. And what they're doing in Iceland now, too, is they're now becoming a leader in carbon capture which is pretty interesting because apparently, and I'm not an expert here, <laughs> but when you pull out the water and the heat from the lower levels of the strata of the earth to generate electricity, you actually create more porosity in the ground below. So if you can create a climate capture machine, the concentrated CO2 can then go back in with water to infiltrate that more porous substrates. And that will solidify over time, so you actually capture that in real minerals. It does mean that we need a lot of water. But hang on, if we can get geothermal working to desalinate the seawater, I think then you're good, good to go. And they are working on that. They have, they, right now they're using fresh water to do that as a trial, but they're gonna look at how they can uh, use seawater uh, and see if that could also work. Obviously you'll have salt as a byproduct, which could be another sort of place of economic uh, opportunity. So again, this is really happening. And uh, it'd be good to watch this and maybe talk to someone who's uh, in Iceland who's really pushing these, both the government level, and that's sort of the, this, this, this group that's, that's pushing this forward. So no matter what the strategy is, um, no matter what the technologies are that are best for this place, uh, I think it is important to really push the agenda and understand what the target is, so you know how to achieve it over as short of a time period as possible. I think Vincente mentioned that I was involved with NEOM. Um, I was part of the, 10 competition teams that went through to design the, the new city. And Saudi Arabia got down to the final two, and of course we, we didn't win, the line won. But we were promoting um, an idea where, and it's not an island, but it's faced on two sides by sea. So it's almost like an island, particularly because it's cut off from the rest of the world by mountains and sea. So Niamh is a huge territory. It's as big as Belgium. And that was also part of the problem at Niamh, is they didn't understand the scale. Uh, they were trying to design a city, but actually, in fact, they had the scale of the country. So, um, area is 26,000 square kilometers. They're targeting 5 million people, which actually is the same density as, as, as you. <laughs> so that's interesting. But that's the same scale. Just a, a tip of the tip of the iceberg at Niam is the same scale as the Rote. So in that fact, it is quite interesting and similar as sort of an island uh, in, in, in parentheses. It's also interesting for you maybe too, because it's so arid. And it's beautiful landscape, I mean, phenomenal landscape. And you can tell why MBS has sort of said this is going to be the place we build the future, the future city. Um, so you have these incredible mountainscapes, and you also have these incredible seascapes. That, again, it's all about protecting those environments. So our plan would look to create three cities. If you think of the Netherlands, this is very similar to sort of Amsterdam, uh, Rotterdam, and The Hague, and Utrecht. And in the middle, the provision for energy and food. We call that the energy gardens. And that could sustain all three of these cities. And actually, we, we sized it so that it could pr produce more food and electricity to actually feed Tabuk, which is just off the page here, and maybe even over to Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt, which is just here. So that was the idea. To, so maybe one or two islands here in the Canary Islands produces more energy than that island needs, but then can somehow share it with other islands. If that, those other islands can provide us more appropriate. So again, we had lots of different ideas to how to generate um, electricity. We have a wide range of, of, of options, wind, solar, etc. Uh, in this case, the solar reflector, which you guys are really good at here in Spain, was the best uh, solution. And, and then obviously the agricultural crops we placed around those. And we thought that could also be an interesting way to uh, design an environment from the get-go that would be pretty exciting to see as you approach this from the air, to tell people you're coming into a place that is very much responsible to the, to, the, to the climate, to the planet. The last thing is really uh, an island as a nature reserve, or maybe we push it even further, this island as a nat national park. It's all about protecting these amazing natural resources, research, uh, re reserves, these incredible natural reserves and resources. I think you've done this probably 
in an amazing way already by protecting some of the most unique landscapes and making sure development doesn't come into those. Those will start to come under pressure, obviously, as you look to add more development, as it is tourism. Um, so how can you do that in the most sustainable way? But I do think if you said to yourself the entire island is a national park, you then start to operate in a different way. The way you deal with, with rubbish, the way you deal with energy, the way you deal with transportation, touching the ground lightly, changes everyone's thinking. So even if the protected areas are only in certain places, you can think of the entire island as being protected. And therefore, all the construction requirements, all the sort of waste requirements, has to take on a much more um, yeah, significant role. So this is a project um, we did in Vietnam, um, off the coast of Da Nang which is right in the middle of the country. So the city of Da Nang really is along these two corniches here, um, which also, it's about two million people, but also heavily under pressure for tourism. With this incredible mountain island. Um, it's very small, uh, only 44 square kilometers. That's the same scale as yours, so it's not the same, same sort of scale, but I think some of the principles there um, could be applicable here. The topography is much more pronounced, I think, than it is here, although, it is about the image. You know, this, this is the backdrop for the city. And it's powerful because it's green. And it's natural. And it's on the sea. But it's under tremendous pressure. So the industrial port was placed here in the 1970s or 80s, which is cringing upon. There, there are developments that are happening further afield, which are having to cut through that topography, which leaves you know, scars in that landscape. So it's in an environment under pressure. So we were brought in by the city government, who um, was under pressure by many, many developers to create this new resource on this island. And they said, let's do a spatial plan to understand where we should allow them to build or not build. It's home to incredible wildlife, both on the land and the sea. It has uh, very interesting uh, topographic uh, features in terms of valleys and peaks. It has a ridge line. So we tried to understand that context from a morphological point of view what the coastal edges were like, bays versus promontories, and even the way in which it fronted different aspects of the sea. The southern face of the island is much sunnier, and it looks down one corniche, where this face of the island looks out to the open sea. It's a very different spatial character. And, and of course, the topography. Most of the island is not buildable. It's between 15 and 25% slope, which you can build, but you really start to hinge upon the natural topography. So there really are only a few areas that one can build economically and sensitively. So again, for us, it's this, this image of this place. So maybe for you, it's the image of the volcanoes against the sky and the sea. And how, what should we protect? What, what should be allowed to be encouraged upon? So we said, based on that sort of green mountain, we said the starting point should be no development should happen 100 meters above sea level. The peak is 400 meters. So we reserve the top three quarters of the island to be preserved as green. That was step one. But the other thing is the green is interesting too because it comes down and touches the sea, particularly where these promontories come and bulge out into the sea next to these bays. So we said we should also make sure that that's maintained. So every time that there's a projection, that should come down to the actual sea level, which reduced that zone of development in, in between those areas. And of course, we also have this principle, which I've also seen here as well, that we don't want to build on the peaks. We don't even, we definitely want to put wind turbines, which I've seen elsewhere in Spain and elsewhere in the world. But this is okay. If it's hidden, if we can hide it in these valleys, that's okay. So that actually allowed us to even increase some areas so by having this three-dimensional model of the island that helped us to spatialize the opportunities. So when we reduced it, opportunities here, we increased opportunities in other areas. And we think that uh, you know, that can be that can be a wonderful sort of thing that would happen. And there's a, there's a new resort here, the International uh, Intercontinental. It's amazing. It sort of does that exactly. So again, we spatialize that three dimensions. These are all one hectare bubbles. We're able to measure that in three dimensions and give back to the city. You know, if you put that in plan, an actual footprint of resort, um, maybe some new communities closer to the city and other mixed use areas. And it was much less than what well, they were under pressure. This is the plan that they gave us to begin with. These were all the proposals that were being brought forward. So this was a more responsible sort of reduction 
but that kind of bit more focused, and maybe even higher value, one can argue. So we didn't take that plan very far. We did sort of framework plans at the scale of each of those areas to give them a sense of how that could play out in real life situations uh, at, a, at a sort of real high level scale. So the other thing we did is said, don't just think the coast is the only thing you've got here. You've got some amazing opportunities to bring people into the island to have eco trails, to have um, opportunities for electric um, scooters to actually allow people to see more of that, that place if it's under a very sensitive light touch. And of course, the marine environment is pretty amazing too. To the north, there are coral reefs, so that should be much more about snorkeling and, and scuba diving. And maybe more of the active uh, recreational things like windsurf and whatnot that happens on the other side of the island. So that's, um, that's maybe something that's more applicable than the other part, but I think uh, all these things are talking about using the best, taking the best resource you've got. And I hope that was interesting and helpful, and I'll stop there. I'm happy to take any questions if there's some. So there was massive flooding. There were floods in Jeddah a few years ago where actually people died because it wasn't controlled. Um, so and now times that water just runs off into the sea. So what we promote is capturing that water. Whatever water does fall, you can actually create lakes in the middle of Riyadh. Actually, we've learned it will evaporate over a long time. But um, for a few months, you can actually capture water, which creates value. So a great example of that is the Wahia Nisa project in Riyadh. We weren't involved with that, but I've got friends and colleagues that were. Uh, and that's a combination of channeling that water when it does rain into a, a linear park system. And then when it doesn't rain, that water is actually in, is enhanced by taking treated affluent, so taking sewage water, um, but gray water, not black water, and channeling that into that same stream. So using the landscape to cleanse the gray water. So at the time it ends up at the bottom of that water stream, you actually get clean water. And that clean water in that case is actually used to, uh, in a fish farm in the middle of Riyadh. So there are ways, I think, just being really efficient, um, capturing, cleansing, and augmenting it with water that we use as people in cities. Um, and you can actually make more from that. So, but you're right, I think between, you know, what's our biggest challenge going forward, it's could be water or food. Um, and maybe the cap, you know, we just hit 8 billion people, and maybe the cap of that's gonna be one of those two things. Uh, 
Hi, Dan. Thank you very much for, for your presentation. It was very helpful and it's uh, good to see very examples in different places. My question is about the last case study that you showed. You showed two little schemes, one in a bay uh, shape, and you were proposing the constructions in that shape. I was wondering if, that's, if, if the water, the rainwater, was not, um, I mean, that's the place where the rainwater uh, used to evacuate to the, to the, to the sea. Yeah. So I'm not sure if there, were, there is a collision there. Thank you. Yeah, sure. No, just same same point there. So we were creating green corridors that would allow that water that water channel to to permeate through development. Absolutely. Um, a lot of times in the sea where you have coral in particular, um, if you if you cut those those lines of fresh water to those areas, they will die. So and that's also the case in the Red Sea. So making sure the nutrients, the nutrient-rich waters, can can be uh, delivered. To the ecosystems, which also feed fish life as well, are really important. So I think in all those projects, we, we look at these green corridors that bring nature through and water through and wildlife through, definitely. Alguna pregunta más? Any question? No? Well, please. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.